What's up guys? How are you all doing? All right, for the last few days, I've actually been systematically posting a number of videos which are quite a departure from my usual commander content. And they've been dealing with the seven point old school singleton format, which is a format that I uh, became aware of about a little over three months ago. It was actually kind of pioneered earlier on in the year. And a friend of mine online just told me about the format, got me excited about it. I went and built a deck relatively quickly and played in an online event and didn't do particularly well, but I learned a lot about the format. It kept me interested in it, and I decided that I would devote some actual time to really working on a deck and doing sufficient testing. And uh, by the time that tournament number nine rolled around, I felt like I was in a good place and ready to go. And so I constructed a deck. I did a couple of other videos along the way and played in the event itself and uh, wound up doing pretty well. In fact, you can see right in front of you, um, I made it all the way to the finals, in fact. And the finals were actually commentated on by uh, a great pair of commentators. Uh, one of them is a guy named Thomas Meadens, who some of you may have heard of or known of. He goes by the uh, nickname Timmy the Sorcerer. He has his own great channel, primarily devoted to uh, old school content. Think a few other things, but primarily dealing with old school. The other commentator was an American named uh, Ken Fritz. And the two of them paired up to, do, to actually do commentary on the match that I played in the finals. Um, the other videos that I've actually produced for the format, uh, I think I've posted three so far. The first one was a roughly 25, 26 minute video that served primarily as just an introduction to the format, uh, laying out the cards uh, that were available in it, and of course, most importantly, focusing on the, on the points list, a, a systematic breakdown of all the different cards in the format that have been assigned anywhere from four all the way down to one point, and kind of breaking down the list, analyzing all the decisions on that list, the, the relative strength of the cards, and making a few suggestions about some of the cards that could possibly be adjusted in terms of their overall cost. But it seems like there was quite a good reception to that video, and I followed it up with a, uh, a series of two deck techs. The first deck tech dealt with the deck that's going to be played by Mikkel uh, Fee, who is sitting on the left side, who went undefeated 5-0, and oh, and then 10 and, and actually 10-0 and oh in games, and then went 4-1 uh, and one in games in the quarter and semifinals all the way to the finals. So he was completely undefeated at 7-0 and coming into the finals. His deck is a, um, I, would, I would call it classic, but there is no such thing, of course, as a classic deck in this format because you're forced to play with a lot of cards that are somewhat unorthodox. But his deck was sort of a classic pink weenie deck, which means white weenie creatures with a splash of red for burn and some artifact removal and stuff. His deck is extremely effective, and he pretty much tore through the competition en route to the finals. Um, my deck, of course, as you might expect, is a control deck. It's uh, my original control deck that I built for the format was four colors sort of effectively. And I recognized along, along the way quite quickly that it was just two, that running four colors with a, a very sketchy mana base that only involved a, a handful of dual lands was kind of just incompatible with the consistency that the format needed, particularly in a deck full of singleton answers. And so I pared it down to just two colors, just a straight blue white. And uh, it was quite effective. I went four and oh, in my pod, I didn't actually get to play a fifth match due to the fact that I joined the whole event about a week after it had started. And, um, but I managed to win my quarterfinal match and my semifinal match and therefore was matched up against Mikel in the finals. And what was so cool was that this match was actually commentated on already. That's about a two and a half hour video. And when I went back and watched the video, I, um, it was really, really intriguing actually to sit and listen to two other players' perspective on the decisions that my opponent and I made throughout the game. And of course, they lacked direct information about what both of us had in our hands and had to speculate, which kind of put them at a disadvantage. So throughout the commentary, they made a lot of very, very insightful calls, a lot of uh, very, very good analysis about some of the plays that were made. And of course, a number of times they had to, they had to sort of do guesswork. Sometimes they were correct and a few times they were off base. But um, what I really thought would be cool, and this is sort of as a, almost as a follow-up to a video that I did um, a couple of years back, actually, an old-school video um, where I was playing in the quarterfinal or the semifinals, actually, of an event called LurkerCon, which was an old-school Eternal Central Rules tournament that was held in Seattle. And uh, after the tournament was over and my match in the semifinals was recorded, I went back and did commentary and analysis of my own match with uh, Sam Tang of Kitchen Table Magic. And a lot of people really, really liked that video. And so what I thought I'd do is actually kind of a blending of, of the two of the original commentary plus my own commentary, which is something I'm just going to sort of call director's cut commentary, where what we're going to do is we're going to watch the original footage with the original commentary provided by Thomas and Ken, 
And at certain points along the way, I'm going to just pause the action and make my own commentary, uh, comment on what's going on, maybe about what's in my hand, what I might be thinking, what I think Mikel might be thinking, what, what, uh, what a particular play might be. And, um, and we'll see how it goes. I mean, this is just sort of a rough take. I've never tried this before, and uh, it could be really bad. And so don't, don't pull any punches in the commentary if, in fact, you don't really like the, uh, the end result. But um, my hope is that people might enjoy getting an analysis of my thought process throughout the game. And um, they certainly generally enjoy hearing my thought process when I'm analyzing the commander games and talking through my, thought, uh, through my thoughts as the game unfolds. One small caveat, of course, that's very, very different from when I play online, and that's the fact that I won't actually know my exact hand throughout this because uh, I played these games about three weeks ago, and I've tried my best to have a recollection of what I have in hand. I, I think I have a pretty solid idea about what I'm holding most of the time, but of course, as time goes by, your recollection of the match fades. Um, <laughs> I really actually should have recorded this video probably a few days after the match was done because I had a much more concrete idea about what I had. It was more fresh, but um, we'll see how it goes. If I'm kind of lost in the weeds, well, you can't argue with the action in front of you. So without further ado, let's kick this off. The first voice you're going to hear is Thomas Meddens. He's from, uh, I believe he's from the Netherlands, actually. And uh, he's going to talk us through, and I will just pause whenever I feel like there's anything I want to add. Here we go, guys. Let's get it. Let's get it going. Okay, so we're here at the seven point finals of Singleton, and it's between Mikkel and Brian Weissman. And I'm joined here today by Ken Fritz, the Dudes of Paradise. Nice. Where are you located? I'm in beautiful Kailua, which is uh, on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. Oh, man, that's nice. I'm here in Amsterdam. I think Mikkel is in France, right? Yeah, and Brian is out of San Francisco, I believe, or Seattle. I'm not sure, but it looks like a sunny day where he's at. I am indeed, in fact, in Seattle, and it was as sunny as you would ever hope in, uh, what was it, December? Yeah, late December here. Hmm. Nice. It's pretty cold here, pretty rainy. Um, so if we look at the decks today, right, because it's going to be a best of five to determine who's going to win this. And uh, Mikel is playing with white and blue, I believe. Uh, Mikel is on white, red. Ah, that's um, it. White, he, red. He's got all the low to the ground creatures. Uh, Just going to pause real quick here while Ken's talking. So, um, people who are not familiar with playing online, and this is actually something I was introduced to as well in this event, um, you'll notice we're doing this strange thing where we have three piles with some dice on top of them. So, this is actually a really, really cool innovation. Um, I don't know who came up with it, but I, I absolutely love it. One of the big problems, of course, when you're playing online remotely is that you don't have any way to kind of audit your, the security of your opponent's deck. You have no way to cut them. All you can do is watch them shuffle and stuff, but you can't actually do anything to touch their deck. So somebody came up with this idea of doing virtual deck cutting. You, lay, you divide your deck into approximately three different parts. You label each, part, each third of the deck as one, two, three, and then your opponent tells you how to orient it. So you'll see, um, I, I think I ask him to pick first and he says something like put two on one and then put three on the top or whatever. But whenever generally there's some, some shuffling going on in deck searching or at the beginning of every game, you kind of go through this process and it allows you to make sure that your opponent is in fact shuffling their deck adequately and cutting it. A lot of flyers and then he finishes the game generally with a big X spell. He's got all of them available. Um, and then Brian's deck is pretty interesting too. It's a, it's a control deck. Um, but he's made some really good choices that is just makes it a, a tough wall to get past. And what 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 would you say are choices out of the ordinary? Because you've been playing this format for a while. I'm still quite a rookie. Well, you know, Brian has a, he has some recursion with his Argivian archaeologist. So if he, he can combo that with his chaos orb, um, he's also using giant tortoise, which yeah. is. Just pausing there for a second while he's talking about me using giant tortoise. <laughs> you can't say enough good things about the turtle. Um, that's obviously just the die roll. And he said odd, and I believe I'm showing the camera in 18. So I was uh, elected to go first. You know, on the <laughs> face of it, 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 it's not a good card. But here, um, it could prove, you know, the necessary roadblock. It, it just sits there as a 1-4 untapped. And it could hold a lot of damage at bay. Um, if he can, if he can get that in one of his opening draws. Yeah, right. Because when it's untapped, it's one blue and one, right? A one one from Arabian Nights. And while it's untapped, yeah. it gets plus o plus three. So it's quite a 
solid blocker. Okay, yeah, they're still continuing to talk about the turtle, and they are both exactly right about what they say about it. The turtle is just, it's one of the most important tools to, in the deck against early rush decks, you know, any deck that's sort of hyper-aggressive. So that would include mono-red, black weenie, white weenie with red. There's just sort of, or, or red-green in particular, and all the fast decks are really sort of stopped cold by 1-4, and they generally have to invest multiple cards in getting rid of it, or at least a, an attack plus a follow-up burn spell or something like that. And that's incredible value for two mana. Um, as far as our hands, we're both keeping here, and from memory, I have, an, I have an awesome hand, actually. My hand is, I believe, I think it's three land. It's an underground sea, an island, a plains, a felwar stone, a serendip Freet, and a control magic, and uh, one other card. So I've got not only early defense against something big he might play, but I've got a really, really critical early threat slash blocker in the form of serendip Freet. So this, this hand is a snap keep. Having felwar is incredible as well. Being able to ramp it's kind of really the only way you can ramp in the format short of investing points in things like moxes or maybe soul ring and uh well the mana vault which costs one which is certainly the cheapest ramp spell that you can play with that actually cost points um Mikhail actually is running soul ring so he's he's invested four of his deck's budget of seven points into a uh into one of the most powerful cards ever printed of course anybody who's played commander is very familiar with soul ring and uh, i talked about the inclusion of the card in his deck um we'll see whether or not he draws it but of course, I'm keeping the hand, and uh, we'll go from there. And I yeah. also like like Wall of Swords, but I guess that's more an obvious choice in the control deck. Right, but I mean, that's what makes Seven Point Singleton so great, is that you don't see these in any other organized play. You know, like, no one, no one is playing these, not even in cubes. So it's just really cool to see these interesting cards be included in such a... A, a powerful, tuned-up deck, you know? So who's, like, who's your favorite, if you have to pick a favorite? Um... Just pausing there, he's asked him a question about who's who's favorited, and uh, one of, in the testing that I play whenever I played against this red white deck, and I tested a ton of games against it, at least 30, 35 games against it, um, because I actually had the advantage of knowing Mikel's deck list as soon as he finished the topic, uh, as soon as he finished his pod 5-0, his deck list was immediately published, and um, that gave me access to it, and I was pretty confident that I would likely face him myself if I made it to the top eight, just given how well he played in the in the first rounds, in the round robin rounds. And if his deck has a turn one threat, and it really could be as, as insignificant as a 1-1, one, one, it really changes the tempo of the game. And when he did not have a turn one creature, I and, and given how strong my hand was, I felt like, oh man, my chances of winning this game are probably at least 90% already. Pretty crazy. I think if the game was starting at 25 life, life points, I would give uh, Brian the edge um, four out of five games. But as it is, I... I think um, I I think Mikel has the edge just because he can push the tempo, but ah, it's not looking good for him. He likes to drop a creature every turn, so it's it's pretty interesting. He wasn't able to find a one drop in his opening hand. So Ken just completely recognizes that exactly, and and his designation that Mikel is slightly favored. I feel is well. I mean, it's honestly it's a coin flip. Most of my testing showed that this matchup was pretty close to fifty fifty. In fact, I played a. I played a 10-game series the day before the finals against myself, and it wound up being five versus five. And so when I played the final 11th rubber game, I came out ahead six to five. But, I mean, that's essentially a coin flip. So I think his, his recognition of that is spot on, as well as the fact that um, Mikel's deck really, really wants to play a turn one threat, and he doesn't have one, which can make his chances of winning much lower. Oh, wow. So this is for him, it's, it's like a slow start. Because I know in Singleton, you don't see a lot of one drops. But he really wants to... Yeah, there you go. First creature, White Knight. Yeah. But the Felwar Stone is, is just about optimum for Brian's start. I mean, he needs to get that mana down. So that okay, so I'm going to pause again here, and I guess we're going to get used to this. So I'm looking, at his, I'm looking at his mana here. He's got two mana in play. And, of course, I've always got to be thinking about what are the range of threats that he can deal with. You know, I have the control magic in my hand. I have an island as well. And so I know I can take the, uh, I can take the knight, but I'd really rather grab something better than a 2-2 two -two first striker. There's plenty of other better creatures. As far as the creatures that are truly threatening in his deck, they're the Sarah Angel, the Shivan Dragon. Uh, the Preacher is, in fact, one of the nastiest things against my deck because if he has a Preacher in play, I can't really play anything but Wall of Swords. Uh, for him to take maybe our giving archaeologist but it really actually shuts down a lot of my creature based, based defense and i really don't want to have to steal a white knight i'd rather deal with it in a roundabout fashion one of the reasons why um i feel that my blue white deck is so effective in the format is because while it is classic control and it has a lot of the good control cards it actually runs quite a, a, a 
suite of um, a big creatures as well. A lot of a lot of creatures with just high toughness that um, are, provide roadblocks in the early game against an aggressive deck, and then late in the game they can they can finish your opponent off. And normal control decks, of course, in the format only run a couple of creatures usually, if any at all. And um, because of the format and the nature of, the, of Singleton in general, you have to run way more creatures. So I think I'm actually running 10 or so, maybe 10 or 11 creatures. A few of them are utility creatures and then a, a few big finishers at the end of the game. Um, but anyway, getting back to what I was saying as far as other th cards that are really threatening in his deck. So there's a few key creatures. Obviously, there's the big burn spells. And one of the cards that's most dangerous against me is the card Land Tax. If he gets Land Tax in play and he's able to get it running, his deck can really play in a very effective Land Tax game. And he can thin his deck of land extremely quickly pull all the lands out of it, and it, then it's just a streamlined monster. He basically just draws, he draws action, burn spells, removal, creatures, almost every single turn. And it's very, very hard for my deck to keep pace with that, given the fact that I'm running such a big mana base. I have a total of 27 mana sources in my deck, plus, the land, plus my own land tax, 28. And with only, with only 32 spells to combat your opponent, who's basically destroying spells every turn, it's like he has, it's almost like he draws... An, ex, uh, an extra half a card every single turn in terms of just his overall card quality. So the fact that I have three mana and the Serendip in my hand actually gave me pause about playing a, a third land here because I could play the Serendip and see how he reacts. He might actually just play another land at which point I can safely play a third land because he may not even think that I have a third land in my hand. And therefore he may just try to develop the board. And uh, so I definitely gave it some thought. And after a little while, I decided, you know what? I think I'm going to just take the risk that he has land tax in his hand. I hope he doesn't have it. But, you know, what are the chances he's got it? And, uh, and, he, and I know he didn't play at turn one, so he would have had to draw it um, either the turn that he played White Knight or the next turn. And so I, sh I, I should probably be okay to play a land here, even though it isn't immediately necessary. So I'm just going to get that turned about. That he can gain control and keep counter spells up. Of course, yeah, and that's really the Wiseman style, isn't it? Just have control of the game. It is indeed. And notice I've got blue, blue, white, white on turn three. You really, really can't ask for better. I mean, when my deck tends to really struggle, it's, it's almost always due to mana. And it's very often either due to mana flood or not drawing double white or double blue and just getting spells stranded in my hand. So I am just, I'm just set. This hand is just so good. That's yeah. What, that's what he's, he always he's wants to do. <laughs> Oh man, there you go. Three, four flyer yeah. powerhouse. And and that's what Serendip does. It can it can turn a control deck into an aggressive deck. The Serendip is holding the knight home, preventing two damage there. And then he's likely to swing and then likely drop another answer to the knight on his next turn. Wow. It's a plow. There it is. Plow. Excellent. Problem so solved. Painful. That's good for us. Yes. And then he's gonna take two of those life points gained back and we're back to square one i have to get my charger by the way real quick i'll be right back okay yeah oh what are the odds right <laughs> i wonder if he drew it that turn i'd have to ask him but yep he's got land tax there wasn't even any no hesitation and he didn't even have to uh he didn't even have to play any tricks with me I'll, I'd have no idea if he had in his hand last turn, but either way, I'm instantly super punished for playing that island. There was really no reason to play it. And now my opponent has free reign to land tax, and I'm going to either have to play the land tax game against him, or I'm going to just have to contend with the fact that he's just going to pull all the land out of his deck systematically. And uh, when it comes to those two choices, it means I'm just going to play the land tax game. And we're going to sit around for a while and, and not play a third land. And we'll see how that turns out. Oh! Oh! The land tax is, is going to generate some massive card advantage. Oh, yes, it will. And when Michael's able to get fill his hand with three lands... So right now in my hand, I have, um, I have two spells that I'm considering playing. The first one is Jalem Tome. And uh, Jalem Tome is really kind of one of the powerhouses in the deck. I think I might have a spell list in my hand at this point. I'm not 100% sure. But I do have Jalem Tome, and I also have that control magic that I got in my opening hand. And as much as I'd like to play Jalem Tome, I'm not going to play it when I can't cycle at least one time with it in case he does have a way to destroy it. And it's such an incredibly valuable resource in this matchup. I really can't afford to play it when it just gets destroyed without even cycling one card. So as much as it pains me to gain control of a White Knight... I can't really just take hits from the White Knight and wait for something better at this point. 
what I have to do is just play the control magic, sit back, don't play another land, and I have at least two more lands in my hand. I think one of them is City of Brass. And uh, hopefully he just plays another land and plays a creature, and the knight and the creature that he plays kind of stare at each other for a little while. Granted, he gets to, he gets to draw three land out of his deck as a one-shot, but then maybe he'll, uh, he'll think I don't have any more land to play. He'll be satisfied with the sort of land ancestral recall, and then he'll play some more lands, and I'll be able to develop as well. So with that in mind, I decide that I'm just going to control Magic the Knight, hold the Jalem Tome in my hand, and just hope that he, he's, he's satisfied with his one burst of land tax, and then he, lets, he gives me free reign to actually play lands. Uh, it just makes his late-game X spells that much more powerful. So if Brian has a disenchant, he's, he's likely to use it immediately. Windmill slam on the land tax there. but 100%. It uh, looks yeah. like he stepped away for a moment. Oh, is Brian also gone? Because I'm back now. I've got my charger. And I, I, I'm... <laughs> you can actually see the shadow of my hands moving over the table. I definitely, I most, I most assuredly did not step away. Although I can kind of tell because of the weird background that my, I don't know if it's, if we're using whereby, which is like a zoom type site. And it gives me that sort of weird frame. His, he doesn't have the frame. So there must be some setting for that. But it turns out that my my shorts blend into the background, that gray background perfectly, and it really does actually look like I stepped away. So I don't blame him for thinking that. But if you look closely, you can see my hands kind of moving in the in the reflection. Looking at a land tax, and you were just talking about it, that's huge. It is because he's got those X spells. So adding three more um, is great. Ooh, that's an early answer to the White Knight. And do you but, think Brian is going to stop playing lands now? It looks like it. I most certainly am. Yeah. I, I think that once the land tax happens, even a single time, it's kind of like the damage is done, you know? It's an ancestral recall, right? And it, is it even better in singleton? Um, because you don't, you know, you, you take out the cards and you get more chance to hit those silver bullets? I think the answer actually to that question is yes and no, oddly enough. I think it really is totally dependent on the deck. Obviously, ancestral recall is just universally more powerful. It does require you to play blue, so it would have no place in the deck that um, Mikhail's playing, but I could play Ancestor Recall in the deck that I'm using. And in the deck I'm using, absolutely Ancestor Recall would be better than Land Tax. And in fact, the inclusion of Land Tax and spending two points on it was was definitely the biggest deck construction mistake that I think I made with my with my version, uh, version 2.5, um, because it's just extremely hard for my deck to actually play the Land Tax game. I just have so, there's so little I can actually play in the early game that forces my opponent to play lands and so we're kind of in this weird situation where we're waiting to see who blinks first. And uh, often that's going to be the guy who's playing the reactive control deck. I'm just going to have to either decide I'm going to discard land or discard cards from my hand or maybe lands from my hand rather than playing my own lands. It's just kind of, a, I mean, it just shows you like how bad of design land tax really is from a game, a game development perspective in that it forces the players into this bizarre situation where neither person wants to do anything. And, uh, but you, Ancestral Recall is definitely not at its best in my deck due to the fact that it, I, drawing three cards early means that you, uh, you often have to discard because, there's, again, you have so few proactive plays to make early. But in a deck like Mikkel's, land tax overwhelmingly strong compared to Ancestral Recall because being able to pull tons and tons and tons of lands out of your deck, thinning it down to nothing and, and fixing all your mana and fueling your X spells, like Ken said, is just incredibly powerful. And the fact that you can draw, I, I mean, I think I've used the card in testing to draw literally 14 or 15 cards out of the deck. I mean, that's just totally insane. That's so much, so much better than Ancestor Recall. They can't even be compared. So I think, I think Thomas's question is excellent. And so the answer is in the deck on the left, yes, by far. In the deck on the right, definitely not. Well, I, I guess it's much better in Singleton because as we both know, Ancestral Recall has four points assigned to it. Mm -hmm. Um, True, true, land tax, I, I think land tax should have two points assigned to it, but I, I don't even know what its point schedule is, to be honest. It's oh, actually, I can actually it's, check, it's, check that. Uh, it, it's got to just be an auto-include, right? Um, if it's zero points, but at one, I think it's an absolute bargain here. I know it's not zero. I, I, I know that. Okay. But okay. Uh, it's two points. Okay, two points. Yeah, that's where I put it. That's, I mean, I, I think that that's reasonable. Yeah, so two points, I think um, it is better than Ancestral, you know? I mean, if, if, if you consider that Brian either missed a land drop or chose not to play a land, I mean, 
this still puts that's an interesting play right there to bolt his own white his own white knight this early um i mean i i understand why he would do it i think that he's not going to really be able to mount much of a much of an offense with a white knight in play given the fact that it has first strike it, it can take down most of his creatures unless they're banded together and also have first strike so killing the white knight with the lightning bolt i think is a pretty solid play given the fact that i'm tapped out um I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't know what's in my hand. He doesn't know what I'm thinking. And he definitely recognizes how threatening White Knight is in terms of blunting his own offense. And the play makes a ton more sense as soon as you see the thing that he follows up with. Michael in the driver's seat because he's low to the ground. He doesn't need more than three mana to operate. And we just saw another answer there from, uh, from Michael. Yeah, they're playing fast and loose, you know. Um, but that White Knight is a big roadblock. It's a... You know, two two first striker, which you know can pose problems to the majority of Michael's deck. Absolutely so true. He's got to get rid of that before he's going to be able to effectively attack on the ground, at least. So we've got the uh, order of light beer, order of light beer, right? Uh, so some pressure from Mikel. So what what's Brian's life total? Twenty three, I believe. Twenty one currently. Uh, he should be at 21 because um, oh, the, the knight got in for two after the plow of the dip. So I talked before about how I really, really wanted to play the Jalen Tome and I could actually tap it and use it right away. But I feel like I'm definitely not going to play another land here, right? I'm not going to let him land tax again. And I have to just take the risk that he has a way to destroy this Um they're really, at least if he does that, it means that he probably can't play, he can't pump the Order of Elite Boar for one turn, which will save me one point of damage, unless he plays another land. If he plays another land, then I can play land myself. So I'm actually, I'm actually running out the Jalen Tome here. There's no real realistic way to protect it, and I'm kind of hoping that this actually compels him because he's going to want to pump his creature to play a fourth land, and, uh, and if he does have a way to kill it, well, then I'll be able to sort of enact my game plan, and I don't have to worry about land tax for a turn. I'm definitely going to do everything I possibly can from getting him to activate land tax any more of this game. There he goes. Jalen Tome. Oh, that's a great card. I call it the paperback. Um, it's not quite a book, but uh, it gets the job done. I like Such that. Such a great nickname. The paperback. And you can see it here because it must be tempting for Brian to play out land number four and activate the paperback straight away. He doesn't want to do that because yeah, he doesn't right want to give Miguel the chance to dig up another three lands with the land tax. Yeah, so we're kind of in a who flinches first situation, but I think that Mikkel currently has the advantage. He just filled his hand with land. Um, he can cast the majority of the cards in his deck with only three mana, so... Um, yeah, right. I mean, he's just going to keep pushing the tempo. And he's got a lot of uh, cheap creatures in the deck as well. So I fall to 18. Okay, so it looks like he elected to pump the... Knight, which is going to be for three, putting Brian down to 18. There's some pressure for Brian. So I think on that draw, I think I actually draw Recall. So I have Recall in my hand right now, and I am I breathe an inward sigh of relief when I'm able to actually untap with the Jalem Tome in play, which is just fantastic. Because now I feel like, yeah, I'm going to be taking three damage a turn against a, a, weenie, burn, a weenie deck with Burn. But the Jalen Tome is just so powerful, it sort of effectively gives you a deck of half the size. And I will definitely find some solid answers here. Probably just a good creature, maybe the Wall of Swords, or the, uh, the Old Man of the Sea, even Preacher. Something that he might have to deal with. He's already used a Lightning Bolt, so that makes the Old Man of the Sea just a little bit better. And I'm pretty confident that the uh, Jalen Tome should deliver me to, uh, to an out or a good solution relatively quick quickly. This is not where you want to be with a control deck. You don't want to be under pressure. Yeah, that's yeah but picture if you had a giant tortoise. He would be perfect, right? <laughs> I would be perfect. Yes. I would love that. I want to see the giant tortoise. <laughs> yeah. It's it's so weird to think, like, you know, we know Order of Lidbur. When you when you mentioned Fallen Empires, you mentioned the Orders and him, and it gets stopped by a giant tortoise. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, just, it is true. It's fun. <laughs> I, I also like to see what I really enjoy of, of Brian's list is Old Man of the Sea. Which, oh yeah, you know which can take possession of the palm knights. It can, yeah. I mean, um, but old man gives it back if the pump knight's power exceeds. Ah, so if okay. old man were to activate, uh, Mickle could pump in response, and then old man 
would check its power, I believe, and send it back home. It would actually not even, it would not actually change size, which is actually quite important. The old man of the sea says that it gained control of a creature with power to equal to or less than the old man's power. So if he were to pump in response, in fact, the old man's would, the old man's ability would be countered because it's no longer a legal target. And, uh, but it also says that if the creature's power ever exceeds the old man's power at an end point, the old man sort of loses his grip on it too. So I wouldn't be able to pump the, if I, if I took an order leap where I wouldn't be able to pump it up to 3-1 either, it works in both directions. So as long as he's got two white men untapped, I can't steal the order of leap or on his turn. But of course, the fact that I get to grab at the end of his turn and then untap and grab a second time means that I'd actually be able to gain control of it over two turns unless he had four white mana available. Yeah, wow. That but one... yeah, Old Man of the Sea is fantastic. I just bought one especially for this format. So I take two there and fall would be an to, interesting uh, I fall to scenario if we're going to see that. So now the pressure's coming down. Ication Priest. I think uh, wow. Brian took... All right, so I'm going to pause here again. There's two things that are very important here. Let me see if I can actually wait for... You just now, which get is... out of the way. Okay, yeah. So I'm going to direct your attention, first of all, to the left side of the battlefield, where there is very distinctly a plains and a mountain untapped on Mikel's side. And then on my side, you're about to watch me make a pretty dumb mistake. Um, I'm nearly certain I don't have Counterspell or Mana Drain in my hand, so leaving two blue mana untapped makes absolutely no sense. And at the end of his turn, I go to draw with Jalem Tome, and in doing so, I tap the Felwar Stone and my Plains, which are both of my sources of white mana. And as I do this, I'm thinking it, as soon as I do that and I tap the Jalen Tome and I reach over to draw a card, in my head I, I think to myself, oh my god, if I draw Disenchant now, I can't cast it. And I'll give you exactly one guess about what's sitting on top of my deck. And this is a big deal in terms of how this, it affects this game. It's, it's a really, really dumb mistake. Put him at 16. I played, um, I organized a Fallen Empires only tournament where... where <laughs> <laughs> Where Priest was surprisingly strong. Fallen Empire's only tournament. You see my hand sort of go down and, and manipulate the planes. That's that's such a tell right there. I'm just unconsciously thinking to myself, oh my god, I just drew Disenchant and I can't cast it. I really wish that I had tapped my land differently. <laughs> uh, so it's, a, it's such a huge deal, right? Because if I draw a Disenchant there, I can play it at the end of his turn and I get to untap and play a fifth mana and I've got five mana available to do whatever I want to do. Instead, I'm gonna actually have to cast the Disenchant during my main step and then play another card. And that's extremely important because that means that I don't have two additional available mana to use the Jalem Tome. The Jalem Tome right now is my way out of this mess. And the fact that I tap my mana wrong there means that I'm actually gonna have to draw one less card off of it. And that could prove decisive in this game. It's that big of a deal. I mean, it sounds like a uh... You know, me, when I forgot to mow my neighbor's lawn and get my $10 mm. uh, when I was in sixth grade. <laughs> I used to, I mean, it kind of came up when I started playing and I didn't have much money and people, you should just give me Fallen Empire cards because nobody wanted to play with them. So I, I, yeah. I always had a lot of Fallen Empire decks. So I think it, that, I, that idea to have a tournament with Fallen Empires only came from that childhood memory. That's so great. That's so great. And and you're breaking off the big combo. Acacia Town, yes. Hand of Justice. <laughs> yeah, I had like I didn't I, I had a real Timmy deck where I did something <laughs> with Deep Spawn and Hummerit Spawning Bet and Goblin War Drums uh -huh. and uh was it Tidal Flats, the card that gives them plus two plus O oh, every turn number three or something? Anyway. Yeah, yeah, Tidal Flats. Yeah, yeah that was the... that was my combo. Uh, it was tough. It you was know, tough. I, I, I feel like for all the concepts of uh, Fallen Empires, it was wonderful. And I think it gets a bad rap, but the game designers were trying to dial it back a bit. They didn't, you know, they had just moved on from the unlimited power. Ooh, there it is. That's disenchant what they so there's the disenchant that I should have been casting at the end of his turn. This is a big move, right? We kind of yeah. could have seen it coming when he played land number four. Yeah, yeah. This is... Uh, so now Brian is going to... Ooh, okay. Ooh, Chaos Orb. Yeah, I expected him to use the paperback, right? You probably expected the same. Yeah, I would have been able to use the paperback if I hadn't been an idiot at the end of the last turn. But this is a better um, option, I guess. I think, I think he uses the orb, or he casts the orb because he knows that the... 
Okay, so again, I'm going to look at the interaction here. So Mikel has Plains and Mountain untapped right now. I have Chaos Orb. I obviously look at his mana and make sure. So I know Mikel's list in and out. I've tested against his deck a million times, and he has both Disenchant and Divine Offering in his deck as instant speed answers to Chaos Orb. I've talked about this before in other videos, but I think for people who are still new to old school format, it's, it, it's worth repeating. Old, um, Chaos Orb actually has a unique distinction among, I think, all artifacts and all of magic. It's the only artifact that can be essentially stopped by a disenchant. Its effects can be stopped by a disenchant, and that's because the card reads, uh, or at least the current ruling of the card, is that wherever, after it's flipped, whatever it's touching is destroyed, but the orb has to be on the battlefield in order to destroy anything. You actually designate, I don't even know if it's targeted, I think you just say, I'm going to flip at that card, and then you flip the orb. So the orb has to successfully resolve and hit something and be in play in order to destroy it, which means that if you respond to orb by destroying it with, say, Shatter, Disenchant, Divine Offering, Crumble, or even your own, the other, even an opposing Chaos Orb, that will destroy the card and it will be gone and it won't generate an effect. So right here, of course, I'm looking at his mana. If I use my orb right now, to go and say kill the order of leap board he's got two mana untapped and if he has divine offering or disenchant in his hand he not only kills the orb but then he just gets a full untap step and he gets to he gets to spend extra mana and that's extremely important not just because he can develop further and i have no current answers to anything but also he um he can pump his creatures he can he can pump uh either the priest or the order of leap board and deal extra damage to me and in these games i've I've tested a million times. A lot of these games come down to literally one life point. And every single point of damage that I can try to save or squeeze out uh, can often make the difference between losing and winning the game. The difference between being at four is so different from being at three. The difference between being at five is so different from being at four because of the range of things that can kill you. So everything I can do at this point to try to mitigate damage is worth it. And that means I'm going to be activating the, the orb during his upkeep before he draws a card. So... There is 100% of the time it's correct to make this play. There's literally no reason not to do it this way because uh, even if he doesn't have a Disenchant or a Divine Offering, then we're essentially in the same place. If he does have either one of those cards and I use the orb now, I just give him two free mana, which is just crazy. So, of course, I'm going to do it during his upkeep before he draws. Uh, um, that Michael, Michael well, he's, doesn't, he's, he's actually doesn't have an answer immediately or he would have destroyed the paperback i think right so he kind of led with the paperback possibly in it yeah well that's that's actually very very true um i actually did expect based on what ken said I, I did actually expect that the orb would resolve here because i figured my opponent's got me under pressure he certainly has to recognize how dangerous jalem tome is and if he does have disenchant or divine offering in his hand he almost certainly would have killed the jalem tome that said there's still absolutely no reason for me to activate the orb right now at all and so uh, when I activated during his upkeep and I saw this happen, I was, I was honestly genuinely a little bit surprised and shocked, although it does certainly make sense since it, it, he, he definitely wants to defend his creatures at this point. Oh, that hurts. Ooh. That hurts. It's, it's, see, that, what did he that's have tapped? for waiting. He should yes, have activated exactly. that at the end of the turn. I, was, I wanted to say the exact same thing. I was surprised because now he said during the upkeep of Miguel, I want to... I wanna, use the orb i think he was probably going to flip on red i, I i'm not no, sure he wouldn't, no he wouldn't because the land tax just gave mick ah, of um, course so it would go on the would you go on the pump knight or the priest yeah i'd just go all over the pump knight yeah, i would just get it out of the way man. you know that mickle's hand is full of mana he's going to be able to pump the knight um you know in the future i would have just gotten rid of i, I would have just gotten rid of the knight as fast as possible because yeah. it's right now it's really hurting and brian's got to find an answer yeah, and unfortunately, getting rid of the knight as fast as possible would not have actually worked. Of course, he would have just dis divine offering the uh, the chaos orb on my turn, and then untapped, and he'd have two additional mana to, to play another creature here potentially. But that was a rare sloppy play from well, or I think it was sloppy from Brian. Although he seemed to be very conscious, wanting to do it during the upkeep. Yeah, uh, I, um, I, I wonder what his, his thoughts are on that play. Maybe we can ask after. You don't have to ask; just answered it. I I don't I don't think he's going to be happy if you ask about it. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. <laughs> well, I'm not happy about the outcome. it will be like that was game we... one, man. I I don't remember. Well, we've got we. I mean, this is the first game out of five, best of five. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's an it's it's overcomable, but I think Brian is at twelve right now. Yes. Yeah. Um, he's, he's... Okay. So 
On this turn, I'm actually going to have to use a recall. My hand is basically just garbage. I, have a, I believe I have a strip mine and... Um, I have strip mine and steel artifact. Steel artifact is almost essentially a dead effect against uh, Mikhail's deck. He has... I think he has a grand total of four artifacts that I can actually steal that would do anything. He has Soul Ring, Juggernaut. I guess he has a Triskelion. That hardly counts. Uh, Soul Ring, Juggernaut, Triskelion. Um, he also has Aelopile and his own Chaos Orb. And of course, Aelopile and Chaos Orb can both be sacrificed in response to Steel Artifact targeting them. And uh, Soul Ring would be great to steal, but um, at this stage in the game, it would be irrelevant as well. Juggernaut, that's certainly the best target. And Triskelion, you can't really steal anyway. They just deal two to you and then have it shoot itself. So Steel Artifact is... Almost a dead card here in Strip Mine. Not really going to help me either, given the fact that my opponent used Land Tax. So recalling for two here is a total no-brainer. I just need to do anything to staunch the bleeding. I'm already down to 12. And my two targets will be, of course, the only two defensive cards I've drawn, Control Magic and Chaos Orb. It's really on the so he, He's on the ropes. Okay, so we've got a we've got a four-point recall. He's pitching a steal and a strip. Ooh. He's getting back that orb and that control. Nice. So he's got a, he, you know, he's going to be able to, he's got some answers, right? Yeah, because Mikel already played out uh, Divine Intervention, and he, or is it Divine Offering? Sorry, I always mix those two up. And, it's and, Divine Offering, but yeah. Brian, I think, only has two cards in his hand. He, he missed his land drop. Ah. He's not going to be able to play both the orb and, or activate the orb and the play the Control Magic next It's actually turn. three cards, but... Um, if he plays Control Magic, he could give his Pump Knight first strike, but we have to think that Mikkel has an answer to a creature in his hand. He's playing red. Um, yeah, yeah. I think Mikkel yeah. is in the driver's seat right now. Absolutely. He's 100% right about option that. option to, to deal direct damage with red is just so powerful. Yeah, yeah. And a bit, a bit of a flaky screen from Mikkel, but we can still see what he's doing. So he's attacking here. And for three, it seems, he's going to drop to nine. Uh, he just pumped it, so it's going to be four, which puts him at eight. Oh, at eight even. Oh, man. Well, of course, the priest is attacking as well. Aye, aye, aye. Yeah. And Mikkel is at the magic number. He's got five. So uh, he could next turn pyrotechnics and eliminate the order if Brian were to take that. Yeah, so his, his mention about five being magic number is totally spot on. It's sort of the, it, once he gets to five, with the exception of the Triskelion and the Shivan, he can cast everything in his deck, including Pyrotechnics. And um, yeah, I'm down to, he's got a handful of spells. I'm at eight. And this game is absolutely slipping away quickly. And on this turn, though, I draw something that gives me at least a little ray of hope. I draw Copy Artifact. Fantastic, right? And as tempted I might as I might be, to copy the Jalem Tome to try to just speed through my deck. I just need two orbs this turn. I need to be able to just put something down, one preemptive answer and one immediate answer to get rid of the uh, Order Leap Orb. But I'm I'm definitely on the back foot here, and uh, I feel like this game is, in fact, slipping away quickly. I've played enough games against this deck to know that if I get down to eight and I don't have any type of board presence at all, the density of spells in his deck is just so high that uh, I, I really can't answer his deck one for one very effectively. I have to get something in play that's big, that, that takes multiple cards from him, and I need to do that several, generally several times. Or I need to play something that just destroys a bunch of his stuff. And uh, so far, none of those things have happened. I'm not going to win the game by Chaos Orbing his creatures one, one at a time. For all I know, he's got four more guys in his hand, and he's just waiting for me to cast something like Wrath of God so that he can just play two more of them and continue pounding my face. Um... He's got, he's, Mickle just has uh, all yeah. the big X spells. Every time he plays a land, the X spell gets more and more threatening. Brian's at the, at the point where one fireball is likely to kill him in a couple turns, you know, so. Yeah, and he even has detonate, which, you know, represents some dire damage as well, and then take care of an artifact. Yeah, yeah, detonate is great. Mickle detonated my icy manipulator. Oh man! In, in the semifinals, it was it was brutal. <laughs> I, I I like like many Swedish players. I played it in a in a goblin brew a couple of times, and you oh, know the, it's the, fantastic. Yeah, the, the the great thing is it does direct damage. The bad thing is it's sorcery speed, so it doesn't deal with those annoying mistress factories. Ooh, look oh, look at this! Oh, what a great! What a great draw. That is fantastic. Yeah, that was an incredible That is deck. fantastic. Mickle could be right back in it. He's He's got to answer that night. This is so Is he going to wait? So, of course, I'm, I'm having him go again. You notice he's got Plains Mountain Mountain untapped there. For the same reasons, I'm going to let him go during his upkeep. 
And uh, I, I actually don't, I don't figure he has a disenchant here anyway. It doesn't really, um, and, I, and I'm going to know in a second whether or not he does have it. So I am, in fact, going to just do the same thing. I'm going to flip during his upkeep and try to force him to spend two mana right away. I'm going to do that, of course, before he draws. Again, for exactly the same reason I did it the first time, there is no reason not to let, wait for him to untap before he draws. Is he going to give him another draw again? Wow. Oh, man. I, I would you just know, flip. You know, he's flip. top decking the answer, but what if... He, okay, Brian says, wait, hang on a second. I would just Why flip. Why is he letting him untap, though? That's my question. I'm letting him untap, obviously. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm letting him untap because he doesn't get a free disenchant if he ha happens to have it in his hand. There's no reason not to do it. Right? Yeah. That, yeah, it's exactly the same as what he did before. Although, of course, now, I mean, he also played a disenchant earlier in the game, right, Mikael? So he doesn't have disenchant. Um, right, but, I mean, my question is, why is Brian letting him untap? Because I, 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 I don't think that there's any, like, what has he got, a fissure so he could untap and then fissure the plant? You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no instant speed thing that is going to change it, but I just, there's, it makes no sense to allow Mikkel to untap again. Um. So gonna use and then the here's the using the copy. All right, so here we go. Targeting his order leaper. And this is the way that you actually play Chaos Or We haven't seen it resolved yet. So the way that it's played remotely is, of course, you can't flip at your opponent's card. So what you do is you designate one of your own cards on your own battlefield, and that's effectively your target. So I'm announcing that Order of Leap Bore is my target, and then I point at my own Chaos Orb, and I say, this is what I'm going to be flipping at. So if the copy of the Chaos Orb hits the other Chaos Orb, it will, in fact, be... The, my Chaos Orb is a stand-in for his Order of Leap Bore, and that will uh, destroy it. So my target right now is my own Chaos Orb, and I can't even remember if I stood up properly and hovered over over my own orb. I think that I was kind of just so kind of desperate in this situation and hyper-focused on the game state. And uh, I took the uh, the flip for granted. <laughs> Shameful to admit it. Um, I do pride myself on my ability to flip Chaos Orbs. I've been flipping them for 26, 27 years. Um, and Ken's about to say something that is 100% accurate. Uh, here we go. Uh I believe I would use the orb itself um, first. Reason being, Brian's got the Argi. Oh, God, guys, look what just happened. <laughs> I did not designate the Underground Sea or the Plains as the target. And I just missed a flip on the Order of Leap War. So bad. Just ridiculous. TV and archaeologist. And that's a crucial miss. Brian's on tilt right now. <sighs> yes, I am indeed on tilt, Ken perfectly identified and if i wasn't tilted enough before i flipped the orb i'm a hundred percent tilted after i flipped the orb i remember just slumping down in my chair here and just going oh my god i just threw the game away if i had any chance at all and I, I really did not feel like i had any reasonable chance if i had any chance at all that miss is nearly it basically just seals my doom how on earth can i survive when i'm going to take i'm going to take at least uh and keep in mind he hasn't played a planes yet here he's going to be able to double pump if he wants to so i'm going to take five and drop to three at three life, there's just absolutely no way I'm going to win the game uh, without any type of pressure at all and him having this giant hand. He just has a million cards at that point that can just kill me. And uh, as soon as I flipped the orb and missed, I was basically 100% certain that this game was over. But I have to sol uh, soldier on because you never really know what's going to happen. Uh, wow. Oh, wow. that's backbreaking. That, that is, is bad. Indeed. It's just for the game, I wish you would have hit him. Yeah, me too. Uh, so if Mikkel has started. a land and an X spell, this is over. I would be surprised if Brian is going to get another turn. I would be really surprised. <laughs> We've seen too. zero burn spells from Mikkel. I, I yeah. was thinking the same Well, we saw a lightning game. bolt, but he's going to oh, go okay. for three. If, if he doesn't pump the knight, we know it's an X spell in the second main. He's just got to show it. What is he going to do? He's going to pump it up. Oh, so look, probably not an X spell. Now. So he's going to okay. deal, yes, he's going to deal four, so he's going to half his life total to four. Yeah, but that means that he's got, um, he's got something he wants to cast. I mean, why not go for five, you know what I mean? Like, Except, and then, so, you're, then you're in chain lightning, lightning bolt reach. Yeah, I, I, 
I, I do totally agree with the commentators here. I just think it's a very strange, a, a very strange play to not pump to get to take me to three because that's really a magic number. He still has chain lightning in the deck, and then he taps the remaining two planes to cast Ala Pile. So that sort of effectively deals two damage to me. But he could have dealt one of those two damage literally just by tapping the mana, and he could tap his two mountains and play the Ala Pile anyway. So he play the Ala Pile, take me down. Well, he'd pump his guy, take me to three, and then play Aelopile, which would effectively take me to literally one life, and he's got two creatures in play. And uh, that would, I think, 100% seal the game up. So I'm a little puzzled by this play right here. I don't think the commentators talk about it very much. Um, but it, it, I remember when he did this, I was sort of shaking my head and wonder, or internally shaking my head and wondering what he was doing. Figured maybe he had red mana on tap, but really, I, I mean, I know everything that he has in his deck. He doesn't have any red instants except for Lightning Bolt. So... And, the red, and Lightning Bolt's already in the graveyard, so it's it just doesn't really make a ton of sense. It's sort of just giving me extra life for no reason. But uh, he, we're so late in the game here anyway, it, it may not be consequential. Uh, oh, Io Pile. Okay, so maybe... But yeah, I mean, still... This, yeah. yeah, I think I think this game is, is over. Um, I don't think Brian is going to say die here, but... Um, the Alio Pile will answer the knight if Brian were to control magic it, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm expecting him to play control magic and then use his orb on the other uh, He should use the orb before so that the Alio Pile has to hit. Oh, he's got something new. He's going to control. I think control is going to do that first. But you say he has to do the orb first. That would have been better. Also, to know if you have a hit or a miss. Um, well, if he misses this orb flip, it's over. But now by taking the knight, he gives Mikkel the chance to alio pile his creature that he just stole, you know? So yeah, you'll notice that he's tapping the order leap worth. That's actually extremely important because as long as it's controlled, it would make a, it would provide a first striking blocker against his own priest. And, um, uh, yeah, the fact that it's tapped is extremely relevant. But the fact that I'm at four and not at three here is also extremely relevant. It it it's like Mikkel has the answer to that knight on on hand already, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and of course knight is is uh, is tapped. Yeah. So that's a problem. Okay, so you notice here I'm actually letting him draw this time. So I he didn't have a disenchant when I orbed last turn and and missed. So I'm, I'm pretty certain he doesn't have a disenchant now. And because he doesn't have a disenchant now, I actually want to see whether or not he pumps the Acacian Priest. If I'm at three, then I have to basically use the orb on Acacian Priest no matter what because of Aelopile. But because I'm at four, he actually can attack. I can take the hit because I'm already effectively at two life, so I die to Chain Lightning anyway. And if he actually invests three of his mana in the Acacian Priest, I can orb in response at that point, and that actually curtails his mana a little bit. It will prevent him from playing something like Pyrotechnics or Shivan Dragon or Sarah Angel or some other more, or even Triskelion, some more expensive spell. And it does give me a tiny, a tiny chance. Maybe I draw into Mana Drain. He taps out to play something big, and I Mana Drain it and untap and cast Brain Geyser and draw into Counter Spell. I mean, you don't really know where this is going to go, but the difference between being at three versus four here is gigantic in terms of its implications on the game. But, uh, if I orb the priest, then he's never going to have any temptation to pump it at all. So at this point, I'm going to risk the chance that that card that he's about to draw right there is in fact a disenchant. Because um, my my if I have any chance left at all in this game, it's going to be that he uh, he attacks. He goes all in on the priest, thinking that you know he plays the land. He pu he double pumps his priest up to three to try to kill me with the pile. I chaos orb it, and uh, I remain at two life effectively, and then I draw something that and and his entire hand is land. Like you got to. Obviously, we're talking about very fringe cases, but you got to you got to try something when there's no other opportunity, and you're you're really kind of at the very tail end of the game. As well, I mean, you know, Brian will have to flip. No, he's on four. Yeah, you have to flip on the priest because the priest priest can also pump itself, right? So he can attack with the priest for two, and then finish it with the uh, io pile. Um. Yeah, but if he pumps the priest, Brian can orbit. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it he can hurt the priest in any event. Brian is going to—I think Brian can survive this turn if Mikkel doesn't have another threat, which he just ripped one off the top. But it—it it seems like 
I don't know what he's got in his hand. Maybe he's just been drawing all land. Yeah, his hand's so full. I mean, yeah, he's he's probably flooded, and it kind of comes down to this play. Game one, I think, is 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 in the books here. There it is. That's a chaos confetti. So he plays orb here, and uh, just he announces it. Obviously, I can't counter it. But with the orb on the stack and the way that chaos orbs interact, they can actually sort of smash each other out of the air. If if I if I, if I let his orb resolve, and then um, I go to flip my orb, he can respond by tapping that red mana and flipping his orb to destroy mine, which will mean that my orb essentially fizzles. That priest will attack. He'll pump it once up to two power, dealing two damage to me, taking me to two, and then he'll kill me with Aelipal. So with the Chaos Orb on the stack, of course, I have to respond by destroying his priest. Ah, uh, okay, so that's, Mik- that's his Chaos Orb, probably. Mikkel is going to tear that into one million pieces. <laughs> and he also, that's a Chaos Confetti. One cool thing about uh, seven-point singleton format is that you're allowed to play proxies, actually. I think you're actually allowed to play with drawn cards as well, so if you draw your own customized artwork, you can play with that, too. I don't know if it extends to every card in the format. It may just be reserve list cards or expensive cards. I'm not exactly sure. I'd have to clarify, but you can definitely play with some degree of proxies, and that's why he's using uh, Chaos Confetti, which I think is from Unglued. In response, he's going to flip. So in response to the cast, he's going to flip. That makes sense. Yeah. And he's going to flip on I believe I'm targeting my own control magic here. Um, Yeah, he's got to flip on the priest. He hit it. At least that's a hit. Yeah, that's a hit. So he, he keeps the priest from dealing any damage. And then now, Mikkel will let the knight untap. And he should orb the control magic at Brian's end step. Yeah, I think that that's exactly perfect. Letting the knight untap and then going after the uh, control magic at the end of my turn. Alternatively, he could do it right now. And, uh, and that would prevent me from having my own divine offering or disenchant to destroy it in response. However, he doesn't really know what I'm going to play. And I could play something big. So, for example, if he were to chaos orb now take away the control magic and get his order back. Well, what if my next play is something like Moat or a, uh, a Mahamodi Jin or an Icy Manipulator or something that just immediately nullifies the order? Then he'd look, he'd look uh, you know, rather foolish for using the Chaos Orb to get back a 2-1 that was immediately obsolete. So I, I totally agree. I think that waiting and holding the orb to see what I do in my turn is, is completely the correct play because then he has perfect information. Although it's it's interesting, right? So I was playing a game earlier. Yeah, I can't I'm, recall. I'm thinking he, he could do it during the untap upkeep as well. And, and well, you want to keep your chaos orb the longest, right? To, to know what your opponent is going to do. Right, but if yeah. Brian has a disenchant or um, mm, you know, true, like Brian, true. Or he can do it in response to the orb and stop the orb from happening. And now he's dead. So out. I think. Yeah. Yeah, if I was Mikkel, I think I'd, I'd activate the orb right now um, on the control magic before Brian has a chance to untap. He, he can't. He he just played Brian this way. I don't know why he wouldn't. Why he wouldn't do it? Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, he should do it right now. You know. Yeah. So we already discussed it. I think that. Having a second creature here changes it a little bit because it would give him two guys. But again, I feel like the chaos orb is such an all-purpose kill-all answer that it basically answers the entire range of anything that I might have. If he Chaos Orbs and gets the Control Magic and the Jalen Tome delivers me a moat or I've got moat in my hand, then suddenly I'm at four life. I don't. He obviously doesn't have any more burn in his hand because I would be dead. And now he's lost the ability to get rid of moat and uh, he's got two ground creatures that can't attack and suddenly he doesn't necessarily have... He, he's, his chances of winning the game actually go down substantially. So um, I, I don't actually agree with Ken here. I think that it's totally correct to, to hang back and just wait on the Chaos Orb, wait to see what I do on my turn, and then act accordingly. Um, he should, uh, he he should be a little the, bit more um, proactive than Ryan at four. Yeah, we see another card from Fallen Empires, so it's the Lieutenant. Lieutenant. So it gives a another soldier plus one, plus zero, I think? Yeah, I think you're right. Can it also give itself a bonus? Yeah, they're both effectively correct here. The card is a 1-2 for two white mana, and it says pay 
one white and one generic to give target creature or target soldier plus one plus zero until end of turn. The card is actually a hell of a lot stronger than it used to be due to the sort of shifting taxonomy of magic creatures. And when I did my deck tech of uh, Mikkel's deck, and uh, I was talking about the possible targets for it, there were a number of creatures that actually were not of creature type soldier at the time when they were printed. I think foremost among them is the Legends Common Pikemen, which is just literally says summon pikemen. And obviously pikemen is not a creature type. So if you look at uh, Gatherer, for creatures like pikemen, you'll see that it's actually now designated properly as a human soldier. And that actually makes the card a great deal more effective than it, uh, than it used to be and makes it even more of a powerhouse in Mikkel's deck. But in a pinch, even if you don't have a good soldier target, and I think the Order of Elite Boar is, for example, a cleric for some reason, um, if you don't have a good target, uh, it can always just pump itself, just like a regular pump knight. And with the amount of mana he has in play, it's already actually capable of hitting me for four and lethal damage. Yeah, yeah. Gives a soldier plus one, I, something like that, man. It doesn't matter. It's another creature that's going to deal damage. So Brian's got possibly, he's going to be looking at two new cards this turn. We don't know what he had in his hand, but he's got the book, so he can go find an answer. Um, but really just ripping off the top right now, searching for some defense. It's interesting, like a Wolf Swords, I almost oh. called that. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, I kind of feel like Brian is playing on spare time, but I mean... He, yeah, he, well, he's doing what he can do, career, right? Mikkel should... Okay, so they're going to talk a little bit about what what uh, Mikkel should do at the end of the turn. And there's a couple different things that he can do here. <clears throat> it kind of fundamentally comes down to what, the question of, do, do I have Swords to Plowshares in my hand? And I think that based on the way that I've played so far, the fact that I've been taking damage and using Chaos Orb to kill 1-1s one and so on, it's very, very unlikely I do have Swords to Plowshares in my hand. It's almost 100% guaranteed that I drew the Wall of Swords that turn, which means that he can pretty much rule out Swords to Plowshares, at which point he just needs to figure out what's the, what's the best possible play that I could make if my opponent, in fact, does still have Swords to Plowshares in his hand and still has the Wall. And so he's got a number of different options, of course. At the end of my turn, I don't have the ability to disenchant or Divine Offering, so he can use Chaos Orb, and it's just a question of whether or not he kills Control Magic to get his, uh, his Pump Knight back, or he kills the Wall of Swords, and now he's got two potential attackers. Um, well, actually, only one potential attacker in the form of the uh, in, in the form of the lieutenant. But he's got an ale pile to remove the two one. And honestly, having looked at the situation and analyzed it a few times, it's kind of it, they're basically essentially the same thing. If he chaos orbs the wall of swords, then he can just ale a pile away the uh, he, he can ale a pile away the order leap or an attack with the occasional lieutenant and pump it to lethal. In which case, I can save myself from dying with swords of plowshares. And in the other scenario, if, he's, if he uses Chaos Orb to destroy Control Magic, he gets his order back. He can attack with both of the creatures. I can only block one of them, and then he can finish me off with Aelopal, provided I don't have Swords of Plowshares. But if I have Swords of Plowshares in that case, I Plowshare one of his guys, and the other one smashes into the wall and dies, and he's left with uh, just an Aelopal in play. Um, but in that case, I do have a Wall of Swords in play, which has further value going down the road. So I think, actually, of those two plays... The correct play is the one that he rightfully chooses, which is destroy the Wall of Swords right now, untap, use Aelopal to remove uh, control magic, and then attack for lethal with the uh, Acacian Lieutenant. And so, uh, yeah, kudos to Mikkel for, uh, for taking that line. At the end of Brian's turn, Mikkel should activate the Aelopal to shoot the, the, control, ma the, uh, the control magic knight. And then the orb to hit the wall of swords, right? That is exactly right. That's that. That I think is absolutely the correct play. And then it's game over. Let's see. Let's see if he see. hit with the orb. Wonder what he. What is he going for? Yeah, that's hard to say, right? We don't know. Oh, he's flipping. There it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's he's following the line as. Yeah. The the only obviously the one small caveat there is that whether or not the orb successfully hits its target, and and of course as you saw earlier in the game. You can miss with it, and if he misses and leaves me with Wall of Swords in play, then using the Chaos Orb before using Aelopile makes a ton of sense, because with Aelopile in play, if he attacks with both the guys, he can actually pump either creature large enough to get through for, or actually, I guess I'm, I, he still doesn't have the Order Leaper in play, but he can still actually uh, use the Aelopile to destroy the Pump Knight, and then eventually use the Lieutenant to, to punch through the Wall of Swords if, in fact, he misses. So 
in, in his case, actually, um, his ability to win the game right away came down to flipping the orb successfully, and he absolutely did that. I suggested, and then he should... Oh, he's not doing oh. it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would just he's... use... I mean, he's on four, right? Yeah. But why wait again? You know, Why wait until you see what you draw? Why not just do it end step, and then you have more mana to pump the lieutenant? Strip mine. So he'll give it first strike. And that pretty much precludes any comeback with Swords Plashers as soon as I put that in the graveyard. And I guess I could have I guess I could have just tapped it for white mana to get him get him to think a little bit, but really what's the point? So his knight has first strike, so he has to kill it with the alio pile. This is gonna give Brian one more turn. Um Wow. Well will it you know, I mean he can pump the lieutenant? Oh yeah, he can pump the lieutenant, he can give it plus two plus oh in total, right? And then deal it's, three damage. You're right. He's going to have another turn. So uh, Thomas has sort of misread the uh, the mana that Mikel has in play right here and thinks he can only deal three uh, a total of three damage. But if you actually count his mana, he's got six mana. And that is a pump effect that requires two. And two and six divided by two is three, plus one is four. So he actually, actually can attack for lethal damage here and kill me. If you notice just to his right hand, I'll move the cursor over there. You can see there's definitely four life points indicated there. And when he attacks me, it's very peculiar, actually. He taps all four planes, so all of his available white mana, and indicates that he's attacking me and pumping his occasional lieutenant twice to take me down to one. And he actually, I believe he says take three, at which point I happily reach over and adjust my life total down to one, and you'll see what happens afterwards. So, yeah, I think that that's going to be three, and then Brian is... Yeah, he's going to go to one, I believe. Yeah, you're right. He's going to have another turn. Or is it... Oh. So then at this point, he uh, he actually goes and realizes that he's only done three damage, and he readjusts his mana properly to deal four. And, of course, I'm going to let him do that. Yeah, I mean, we're playing in a, a, a fun, casual online event. And one thing is, it actually is... It's really, really easy because of the fact that we're playing on webcam. It's really easy to miss little things like that, just to miss your opponent's life title by one point or, or not quite notice what mana or maybe even sometimes a creature that your opponent has in play untapped and so we kind of have to just play these approach these games with a degree of of casualness that you wouldn't normally see in a regular tabletop tournament so i'm more than i'm more than fine with him readjusting his mana and dealing lethal damage to me anyway it's one white and one yeah he can pump it's one white and one to pump it so he had enough he can make it a four powered creature so he's going to win this first game he is indeed. All right. Congrats to uh, Mikel for taking game one of our match. Um, obviously, I think the decisive moment of this game was just that Chaos Orb flip that happened. I mean, I, I feel like based on the range of things could have happened, I actually went and rabbit hunted and looked at the next couple cards in my deck, and there was no there was no real help coming soon. The problem is I'm just I'm so low in life there. Being down, I mean, I would have not have taken as much damage from the Order Elite Four if the, if the Orb flip had successfully hit it, and maybe I'd have a little bit more breathing room. But getting down this low and not having any type of clock on my opponent, and my opponent having pretty much all of his X spells still remaining, he still has Fireball, Disintegrate, Pyrotechnics, Earthquake, and Detonate remaining in the deck. It's just, I feel like I am, in fact, to quote uh, Thomas's statement from earlier, I, I, I'm definitely living on borrowed time in this game. And uh, yeah, I just, I, I feel like probably I'm less than maybe 5% to, to mount a comeback. To, I mean, he could still get... He could still get mana flooded and draw a bunch of blanks in a row or some stuff that's not consequential, and I could get lucky and draw into Brain Geyser or something and get out of it. But I didn't think that I had really much of a chance anyway. And uh, yeah, the orb was definitely the decisive mistake in the game. So we are done with game one. The next video will be uh, a full coverage of game two, which I can already tell you is one hell of a barn burner. It's going to be a long video, but it will definitely be worth the wait, and hopefully uh, you guys are excited to see that. Thanks so much for watching, and see you soon.